So now we're going to talk about the other half of endocrine, which is what we will all see much more often. You know, again, sorry to my ortho peeps, but you're always going to see somebody with diabetes. So good to know about it. And then thyroid disorders are incredibly common. So again, no disclosures. What we're going to do for this presentation, we're going to spend a lot of time on diabetes, differentiating between type 1 and type 2. We're going to talk about what therapeutic options are available, and then we'll go into, you know, some more details about other, you know, um, conditions such as metabolic syndrome and obesity, hyper and hypothyroidism, thyroid nodules, and thyroid cancer. And fingers crossed I have enough time so we can do the test your knowledge round two. All right, so diabetes, no surprise, pantry level three, they'll be all over the pants, so something that you need to know, not to bore you with statistics, but just know that it is omnipresent, it costs a lot of healthcare dollars per year, so it's, it's just something that we're all going to encounter, especially in kids, that's something newer coming up, you know, just within 20, 26,000 kids were diagnosed with type two diabetes. Um, most patients with diabetes will have type two versus type one. <clears throat> But we'll start by talking about type 1 diabetes. So type 1 diabetes is the patients who are completely insulin deficient. Most often it's immune or autoimmune mediated. So for some reason, the beta cells in the islets of Langerhans and the pancreas have been affected. It could be genetic. There's a couple different genes that are responsible for it. It could be triggered by environmental agents. You know, sometimes we call it like the hygiene hypothesis or viruses, et cetera. Uh, as uh, Casey had mentioned, we're seeing a lot more patients who have pancreatic cancer, who have total pancreatectomies. They are also type 1, or they, they are also patients with type 1 diabetes. And uh, just kind of an FYI, patients with uh, chronic or necrotizing pancreatitis or cystic fibrosis related diabetes can act like type 1s. I try to not use the terms insulin dependent because patients with type 2 diabetes can still be on insulin. And juvenile diabetes, again, doesn't always mean that they're type 1 because, again, we're having a lot more kids that are being diagnosed with diabetes. Uh, for, and you can also be, sorry, you can be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in adulthood, but most of the time the peak times are between ages of 4 to 7 and the ages of 10 to 14. Clinical manifestations, we all know the polys, that is the most common. So polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. You can have weight loss because of that. Uh, you can get more infections, such as vaginal or cutaneous, blurred vision, fatigue, weakness, abdominal pain, uh, or the, the hyperventilation and deep Kussmaul respirations. Those are a little bit more along the diabetic ketoacidosis line. Um, and that can be a first presentation of patients with type 1 diabetes as well. So diagnosis, for patients with type 1, you can either diagnose if they are symptomatic and have a random glucose greater than 200. If they're asymptomatic, you need a fasting plasma glucose greater than or equal to 126 or an HbA1c of greater than 6.5. You do want to you do want to get two abnormal tests. So this is either, for example, two A1Cs on different dates meeting those thresholds or both the fasting glucose and A1C drawn on the same sample. I want to point out that you don't want to get a point of care A1C for diagnosis. You want to make sure that that's from a venous blood draw. C-peptide can be helpful for uh, diagnosing type 1 diabetes. So remember that the insulin molecule starts as pro-insulin and gets cleaved down to the insulin molecule, and part of a piece that gets cleaved off is the C-peptide. So patients who are insulin deficient will have low C-peptide. And again, as I mentioned, because most patients do have autoimmune causes for type 1 diabetes, getting specific antibodies are helpful in making that diagnosis. How you manage type 1 diabetes, insulin, insulin, insulin. There's really no other way around it. You can't diet, you can't take metformin, you're going to need to use insulin, and it's going to be through either the use of basal and prandial insulin or mealtime insulin or using a continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion or insulin pump therapy. Just to point out, not everybody's a pump candidate. That's usually a more advanced skill, so we don't throw all type 1 patients on insulin pumps. Uh, because you're on multiple daily injections or on a pump, you have to monitor frequently either through point of care testing um, with a finger stick or with our newer continuous glucose monitors or CGMs. We do sometimes use orals in patients with type 1 diabetes, uh, but that's really rare because it actually is off label and diabetes education routinely because we can always learn something new.
And I will have a section about insulin later on, so I, I'm not gonna forget to talk about that. What are our goals for treatment? For most patients, we're gonna to wanna to get that A1C to less than seven. There might be some more strict goals perhaps for a pregnant patient, uh, or you can have less stringent goals, perhaps somebody with hypoglycemia on awareness or our elderly patients that you wanna avoid falls from hypoglycemia. But for most patients, you're gonna aim for that less than seven A1C. If they're controlled, follow up every six months is reasonable, but if they're uncontrolled, you're gonna to wanna to have them follow up every three months. I know sometimes Medicare does require frequent, more frequent visits occasionally every three, so just kind of be mindful of that. So this will be something different to distinguish between type one and type two diabetes. If you're diagnosed with type one diabetes, you don't have to screen for your microvascular complications until five years after the diagnosis or if they're diagnosed really young at the age of 10. And remember that the microvascular complications we're gonna look for are nephropathy, and we're gonna check for a urine, we're gonna check a urine albumin creatinine for that. We're gonna check for retinopathy with a dilated eye exam, and then we're gonna check for neuropathy with a monofilament foot exam. In patients with type one diabetes, you're also gonna to wanna to get a TSH because hypothyroidism is commonly seen, and depending on their symptoms, because this is autoimmune, you may wanna consider screening for other autoimmune diseases such as celiac, uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, or adrenal insufficiency. So diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA, is an endocrine emergency, and this is a very severe hyperglycemia. And usually how these patients present, you know, are all the symptoms that I mentioned previously, but to, you know, the 10th degree. So they're much more severely ill. They get that fruity smelling breath. Once you smell it once, you're never really going to forget it. Uh, so look for that. And then they might have abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. Maybe some patients are even extremely drowsy or lethargic. Causes, so, you know, it's not always missed insulin doses. Again, it could be the first presentation, maybe precipitated by an infection uh, or other medications could cause this. Because it's an emergency, you wanna refer them to an ER or a hospital for treatment. And what you'll see on lab testing are a high glucose, usually greater than 250, a low bicarbonate, a high anion gap, a high beta-hydroxybutyrate, and a low arterial pH. So I know that I went through that really fast. It's gonna take some time, I think, just you know, reminding yourself of what those criteria are. I honestly have it on a post-it note on my computer. But you know, I think, I think what's helpful is you know, anion gap metabolic acidosis with hyperglycemia and the high beta hydroxybutyrate. Ways that patients with known diabetes can prevent this is by checking their blood sugar more frequently and giving more frequent insulin where they're, when they're ill, and also checking their ketones in their urine. So if you have urine ketones, then you're gonna wanna call your provider and figure out what to do next, if that's still an issue.